mystery begins with the mysterious seafaring, well-organized Mycenaeans. By the time of the first surviving literature, the epics of the 8th century BCE, which have come down to us under the names of Homer and Hesiod, the Mycenaeans had vanished. Yet they had spoken Greek and they had worshipped by and large the same gods as the classical Greeks. And since the Mycenaeans used a form of writing and built imposing structures, they left some patchy evidence. Near the beginning of the Homeric epic Odyssey, first written down in around the 8th century BCE, but set in the imagined Mycenaean past, Telemachus sets sail in search of news of his father Odysseus. He sails overnight from Ithaca to the Greek mainland, the southwestern coast of the Peloponnese. Now that's a fast rate of progress for a distance of 120 nautical miles, but actually feasible since the goddess Athena has granted him a favorable wind. At dawn, he puts into the sandy beach at Pylos, but he finds it surprisingly crowded. Homer says, the people of Pylos were offering sacrifices on the seashore, black bulls for the earth shaker with his blue black hair. There were nine groups and 500 men sat in each group and each group was putting forward nine bulls for sacrifice. That makes 4,500 men as well as 81 bulls. The people of Pylos clearly had a very high regard for the god of the sea and the earthquake, Poseidon of the blue-black hair. Telemachus has picked Pylos because he hopes that Nestor, its elderly king, may have information about Odysseus. Nestor is one of the very few Greek warriors to have actually survived the Trojan War. He was already old when he joined that expedition. He's also a very experienced sailor. Indeed, he's the only Greek warrior at Troy who'd once been an Argonaut. He sailed with the superheroes Jason and Heracles to the remote Black Sea in search of the Golden Fleece. In Homer, he's too old and wise to take sides in the partisan squabbles of the Greeks, or indeed in direct combat. But he leads his warriors into battle from his chariot. He's a horseman and he dispenses his friendly advice to younger men. Nestor's seaside kingdom of Pylos in the Odyssey is described as sandy, which it is, or sacred, and its citadel well built. Its cups are made of gold. Its palace contains row upon row of high seats at the banqueting table. The wine that pours for special guests is of a precious vintage. And the paving stones of the courtyard where Nestor likes to deliberate are polished white and glistening with oil. When a heifer sacrificed to Athena, her horns are specially gilded with bright gold by a skilled blacksmith. And the poetic account of that civilization on Pylos is in essence the way that the Greeks in the 8th century BCE imaginatively recreated their own past of several centuries earlier. Much as we might recreate imaginatively the world inhabited by King Arthur or Robin Hood. But some of the phrases in the epics were certainly handed down over several previous centuries from the Mycenaeans. Scholars will always argue about how much of the Iliad and the Odyssey was inherited from the songs that Greek-speaking minstrels had sung undoubtedly in those late Bronze Age Mycenaean palaces in the 15th to 13th centuries BCE. But this debate changed irrevocably as a result of the archaeological recovery of the Mycenaeans, which has now been going on since around the middle of the 19th century. Mycenaean palaces have been excavated at several of the sites which are really important in Greek myth. Apart from Pylos, Mycenae, we've got Thebes, Tiryns, Theoprony, as well as Crete. It's also been discovered that the Mycenaeans inscribed writings in their script, which we call Linear B, and they were in a recognisable forerunner of the classical Greek language. In fact, the earliest real ancient Greek voice we can hear speaks to us from near the palace of the venerable Nestor. That voice was recorded on a clay tablet between about 1450 and 1400 BCE, but not discovered until 2011. All the Linnibir tablets were inscribed with signs drawn from left to right on a soft grey clay. But sometimes the tablets appear brown or red. It all depends on the heat of the fire, in which each case they'd been accidentally baked and preserved. But that voice from around Pylos resounds from the rubbish dump in which it was discarded all those centuries ago. 
near another Mycenaean palace, slightly inland from Pylos at Eclina. Now, the scribe's actual words on the tablet aren't that exciting. One side records the last part of a man's name, followed by the numeral sign for one. He seems to have headed up a list of personnel. The other side records part of a word relating to some kind of manufacture. But this mundane clay object is incredibly significant because it pushes back the use of writing to record the Greek language into the 15th century BCE. In Crete, the main stronghold of Mycenaean culture away from the Greek peninsula, our understanding of early Greek speakers is much more complicated. Long before the Mycenaeans had begun building their palaces and their complexes on the Greek mainland, another people whose name we don't know, but we conventionally now call Minoans after the mythical King Minos of Crete, they'd established a similar civilization on his island. And Crete played a very dominating role in the Aegean and exerted a cultural and possibly political influence on the mainland as well. The classical historian Thucydides said that Minos was the first person to organise a navy. He controlled the greater part of what is now called the Hellenic Sea, and he ruled over the Cyclades, in most of which he actually founded the first colonies. And this sentence underlies the scholarly theory that the Minoans actually ran a thalassocracy, or a political system dependent on their control of the sea. The Greek for that is thalassa. Minoan civilization reached its apex in the two and a half centuries between 1700 and about 1450 BCE. And the ethnicity of the Minoans is disputed. They spoke another language altogether, and it was almost certainly not in European like Greek. They also used writing, a syllabic script we call Linear A, but that has not yet been satisfactorily deciphered or translated. Now, although the palace at Knossos, which was excavated by Sir Arthur Evans in the first years of the 20th century is by far the most famous. There are several other important building complexes on Crete, mostly around the coast of the eastern half. They include Phaistos, which uh, is the second largest, and Gornia, which was excavated by two intrepid women archaeologists from America, Harriet Boyd Hawes and Edith Hall, between 1901 and 1904. They settled on smaller islands, mostly near Crete, including Thera, which is now known as Santorini. And the mid 15th century, however, the Minoan palaces were destroyed by fire. The chronology is much disputed because there's complications caused by evidence from more than one catastrophic volcanic eruption on Thera, probably resulting in tidal waves which engulfed the whole of the coast of the mainland. Fires may have been connected with the volcanic eruptions, but on the other hand, they could easily have been caused or exploited by aggressive invaders. Now, most of the palaces were rebuilt, but one thing is certain. Soon after the fires, the language in which the palace inventories were recorded changed from Linear A to Linear B. Greek speakers, very likely from the Mycenaean strongholds on the mainland, had taken over the administration of Minoan Crete. So when Greeks sail south to begin that entrance into Greek history, they're already absorbing achievements of an earlier civilization. The reason we can call them Greeks is that they use their own distinctive language. But we'll never know either exactly how much the mainland Mycenaeans had borrowed from the Minoans, nor indeed the precise process by which Greek became the language of power on Crete. The issue is much debated by archeologists in the context of the magnificent Thera frescoes. In 1967, the archaeologist Spiridon Marinatos began digging near a modern Greek farming village called Akrotiri on the southern coast of Thera. And the results were astounding. Buried under layers of volcanic ash, Marinatos discovered an entire town which he called the Pompeii of the Bronze Age. You can actually walk along the route of the paved ancient street that led into the city centre. The residents lived in really impressive villas, some with three storeys, bathrooms and plumbing, all linked up to the town's public drainage system. Workshops and larders containing rich finds of pottery lined the streets. That they were commercial and utilitarian in function and probably dominated by the menfolk is suggested by the lack of fresco decoration in most of them. But upstairs, the domestic living rooms 
perhaps the domain of the women. These boasted elegant furniture and plaster walls painted with some of the most widely reproduced and beautiful visual images from all of antiquity, the Akrotiri frescoes. Those from the West House have such a maritime focus that it was called the House of Admiral. And it contains several different frescoes, including one of an arresting young woman with large eyes and earrings and a head shaved except for a pigtail. She's often identified on no evidence as a priestess, but the richly painted panels of room five make it one of the most famous rooms in the world. Two large panels depict youths. They're naked and carrying blue and yellow fish. But around the upper parts of the three surviving walls, there runs a border, which consists of frescoes painted on a rather smaller scale. One depicts military activities, and the middle one a landscape which has rather misleadingly been called Libyan or Nilotic, because it depicts a winding river, perhaps the Nile, and palm trees. The third, the South Mural, shows a seascape with towns and ships sailing between them. I gasped when, as an undergraduate, I first saw the South Wall fresco, with its splashing dolphins and seven ships propelled by neat ranks of oarsmen. Their rhythmic rowing is conveyed almost audibly by the imagined shouts of the standing figures at the stern. The smaller town on the left portrays an island scene, just like the images which reading about Odysseus' homeland of Ithaca had always created in my mind. Craggy mountains form the dark backdrop to a landscape where wild animals hunt one another. A shepherd converses over a stream with a man of the town. Their clothes are pretty rough and very functional, but other people stand at the harbour watching the ship sail off to the larger city. But it was either the person who painted the fresco or the householder who commissioned it. We don't know which. Were they Mycenaean Greeks? The pendulum has recently swung towards seeing them as incoming Mycenaeans rather than Minoans. Every year that passes reveals further how momentous our understanding of both the Mycenaeans and indeed the later Greeks was the decipherment of Linear B. Finalised in the early 1950s by Michael Ventris and John Chadwick, who built rather than more than they admitted on the earlier work of two Americans, Alice Cober and Emmett L. Bennett, the decipherment has allowed us to listen for the first line directly to the Mycenaeans themselves. Where before we had excavations and artefacts, now there are records of thoughts that took shape inside Mycenaean Greek heads. We even know some of the Mycenaeans' own names, including that of Philaios, a goat herd at Pylos. A remarkable 58 names are actually the same as or similar to the names of warriors in Homer. Astoundingly, some Mycenaean Greek men bore the names of the top heroes on the Greek and Trojan sides, Achilles and Hector. Other names paralleled in the Homeric texts include Antenor, Glaucus, Tros, Xanthos, Deucalion, Theseus, Tantalus and Orestes. And a striking feature of the proper names in Linear B is just how many of them contain elements connected with the sea or with sailing. Fair voyage, Euplus. Fair ship, Euneos. Ocean goer, Pontius. Famous for ships, Nausicles. And perhaps swift ship, Okunaos. In other respects, too, Linea B confirms the Homeric picture of Greeks to whom sailing and rowing were absolutely second nature. Amongst titles designating occupations, we see both coast guards and craftsmen who specialised in constructing uh, different parts of the ships. At Knossos, rowers are definitely included in a list of officials who are supplying or receiving cattle. And at Pylos, some rowers seem to have been conscripted Perhaps they were the sons of slave women. There's even a specific mention in one Pylos tablet of a naval expedition. Uh, 30 men's names, perhaps the personnel who had to man the oars of a single ship, are called the oarsmen to go to Pluron. And Pluron is an actual place on the north coast of the Gulf of Corinth, which is named in the Iliad. So a reason for sailing expeditions of side trade was, was clearly the acquisition of slave labour. Some of the tablets at Pylos indicate that the labour force was actually recruited 
by raids uh, in which captive women and children from foreign countries were brought there and, and taught trades. The women are said to come from across the sea in the Eastern Islands and Asia Minor, from Lemnos, Knidos, Miletos, and perhaps Chios. What sort of religion was practiced by these seafaring people with their Homeric names and squadrons of female slaves imported from overseas? By and large, the gods who turned up in Linear B are exactly the ones that we would have predicted. Poseidon, the great god to whom Nestor makes that vast sacrifice in the Odyssey, was worshipped in reality at Pylos and Knossos. He may even have been senior god at that time of the Mycenaeans rather than Zeus. He wasn't only the deity of water, but the spouse of Mother Earth, and his name means Earth's husband. Other named recipients of the offerings in the Mycenaean tablets are exactly the gods we would expect to be honoured by any pagan Greeks. Zeus appears, Hera, Athena and Artemis. A stir was created by the discovery of Dionysus' cult at Pylos, since the Greeks themselves thought that he was a relatively late import into the Greek pantheon from Asia, and that's the story dramatised in Euripides' play Bacchae. Disappointment is also awaited people who wanted to find either Apollo or Aphrodite, although that doesn't mean that they will never turn up in the future. Other divinities greatly honoured by Mycenaeans include uh, the childbirth goddess, who's called Eilethuia, the winds, who seem to have their own priestesses, and perhaps a dove goddess. The offerings they receive are, are various cattle, pigs, sheep, wheat, barley, oil, wine, figs, cheese, honey and spice tablets. Offerings of a non-edible form include sheepskins, wool and a golden cup, as well as at least one woman. And we get women key bearers, functionaries and probably cultic slaves. The Mycenaeans still lived under a monarchical system, as we can see from their term king, wanax, the Homeric annax. At Pylos, the situation seems to have been approaching an emergency because it was preparing for an attack when it collapsed. The Wanax may also have had a special group of courtiers or attendants, hepetas. Some tradesmen seem to be designated as working for or belonging to the king. We see a fuller, a potter and an armour maker. At Pylos there was also a royal council called something like a gerousia, implying that it consisted of men of a mature age. And at Pylos, too, we catch the glimpse of a category of officials who held um, a very substantial portion of land. And they seem to be in a slightly lower status than the king, perhaps suggesting a system not dissimilar from uh, feudal peasantry. The Wanax may have governed satellite towns further afield through men designated by a term similar to another Homeric term for the king at Troy, the Basilius. Now, in all later periods, pagan ancient Greeks owned slaves, often in very large numbers. And although we can tell that there was a clear-cut division of different types of labour, hierarchy, amongst the Mycenaean lower classes, it hasn't been possible to be absolutely sure whether most of the male workers were technically free or not. There are words meaning slave man and slave woman at Pylos, but these mostly seem to be slaves of the god, which could be a religious honorific status rather than publicly or privately owned slaves. But the Mycenaeans certainly did a great deal of often backbreaking work, and there were numerous occupations that we can read about. Public servants included messengers and heralds. At the upper end of the spectrum of crafts, we have goldsmiths, boilers of ointments for perfume, and a medical doctor. Other earlier Greeks in Linear B include bronze smiths, cutlers, and bow makers. Besides shepherds and goat herds, there are huntsmen, woodcutters masons and carpenters. It's not surprising that shipbuilding is a distinct craft, na o domo. The women in the palaces worked at carding wool, spinning and weaving, but both men and women seem to have been involved in making the actual clothes and working flax, which was probably also crucial for equipping ships with sails. And both fishermen and hunters needed flax for their nets. Women ground and measured grain, but men made the bread. Male stokers and ox drivers, but female bath attendants are also attested. Linnea B has also told us a good deal about the plants which the Mycenaeans flavoured their food with. They had celery, beetroot, cumin, sesame, fennel, mint, pennyroyal and safflower. And some of the words, the names, are actually borrowed from Semitic languages, suggesting that they were actually imported from Syria. 
ancient cities like Ugarit, Byblos and Tyre. And these exotic tastes will have added a variety to a rather basic diet attested by their finds, wheat, barley, almonds, pulses, shellfish, fish, octopus and grapes. They had plenty of wood, elm and cypress. Their furniture is decorated with ebony and ivory. Horses aren't mentioned that often, and those that are, they're used for chariots rather than ploughs and farm carts. We see deers and ass, and dogs are implied from the words for a huntsman at Kunagetas. The visitor who arrived at Nestor's two-storey palace, as Telemachus did a decade after the Trojan War, was taken through a series of ever more stately rooms before he arrived in the presence of the king. He first passed through doors on the east side of the building, and entered an imposing entrance foyer. A large proportion of the Pylos tablets were found in rooms on its left, suggesting that this was the administrative and accounting hub, where people and products which entered or left the palace could be systematically recorded. Then the visitor entered a court, but he won't have minded if he was kept waiting there, because it actually opened onto two adjacent rooms containing a bench to sit on, wine jars set in special holders, and a very large choice of different cups. When summoned to the royal presence, the visitor, after his wine, would have passed through a porch into a vestibule, and only then into the large square throne room, in which the plastered walls were decorated with dazzling frescoes like those at Thera. The throne was positioned at one side, and in the centre there was a massive circular hearth, more than four metres in diameter. And although in winter this will have helped keep the monarch warm, it's actually designed to make a statement, perhaps a, a richer one. It will also have illuminated the really gorgeous decorated walls with flickering yellow firelight. A luxurious lifestyle was enjoyed by the royal family in this palace, just as it was in Nestor's palace in the Odyssey. Wine flowed abundantly. The Pylos excavators had been amazed by the thousands of drinking vessels stored in rooms on the west side of the main building. The palace also held plentiful supplies of olive oil and assigned a separate room to making perfume. On the upper floor, up a staircase, there were many more rooms. And on the ground floor, there were at least two independent suites of apartments. One with a really grand terracotta bath, another a toilet with a drain. The most famous Mycenaean palace is at Mycenae itself, less than an ancient day's journey from Nafplion. The people who lived there enjoyed breathtaking views over the rocky kingdom in the Argolid. Mycenae was built on a high acropolis, the citadel surrounded by massive cyclopean walls. One of its Homeric epithets is well built. But the fabulous treasures which the archaeologist Heinrich Schliemann found in its graves, and which are now on display mostly in Athens Archaeological Museum, they absolutely explain the other Homeric epithet for Mycenae, rich in gold. Schliemann conducted the first systematic excavations at Mycenae in the 1870s with the eyes of the world fastened upon him after his sensational finds at Troy. Some of the visual images from Mycenae have become to define the Greek Bronze Age in the popular imagination. These include the Lion Gate, which is the largest remaining Mycenaean sculpture. Now that had actually been visible to tourists before Schliemann's dig, but it was his genius at publicity that brought it to the world's attention. Even more famous are the golden burial masks, which Schliemann discovered in one of the shaft graves, number 1A, one of which he liked to reveal the contours of the face of Agamemnon. The Mycenaeans' own voices tell us that they were seafaring. Their curiosity about the world was a factor in the very long distances they sailed to both Greek and non-Greek lands for trades and slaving. The wine and perfume consumption at Pylos suggests that they were joy-loving. They seem to have been emotionally honest and articulate and witty as later Greeks, but we can't prove that. Or the names that they gave their cattle suggest a love of words and a sense of humour. One yoke pair at Knossos were called Aeolos and Kalainos. That means shiny or nimble and blue-black. Others were named perhaps with the Mycenaean tongue slightly in cheek. Xuthos, swift. Stomargos, talkative. Oinops, wine-faced, like the Homeric sea. 
hierarchical palace culture doesn't suggest that the strong Greek suspicion of authority was yet well developed. But even here, there are occasional suggestive scenarios in Linear B. There's some rowers um, who've gone absent without leave from Pylos. And there's an agricultural worker at Knossos who's actually been ordered to confiscate the ox from one of the others. Now, we can never know what emotional trauma was undergone by all those imported captive slave women. Their sons, some of whom were presumably fathered by uh, the Mycenaean owners, were often conscripted into the navy. The Mycenaean Greeks remain enigmatic. The lack of fortification doesn't imply any sense of vulnerability or fragility. No, it, it actually creates an atmosphere of, of peace and orderliness. The walled palaces and clay jars consolidate the feeling of, of really careful organisation and placement of objects in space. The frescoes and the evidence for the perfumed oil industry, especially at Pylos, suggest sensuality and the love of physical beauty, of ornamentally exaggerated difference between the sexes, a bright colour and of the sea. But those modulated voices that speak from the clay tablets may be more misleading. They somehow suggest a rather slow, deliberate pace of life and a lack of vitality and emotion. It may be that these Greek speakers didn't talk fast and loud and argumentatively. It's possible they didn't feel passion and use bitter sarcasm. But if that's so, they were different from every other community of Greek speakers who've ever followed them in recorded history. Mm -hmm.